Now, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. In the winter of 1845, James Russell Lowell, an abolitionist, wrote these words to my favorite hymn from the Old Red, not to be confused with Cranberry, hymnal. Lowell wrote, Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Choosing is never easy. And sometimes it is very, very hard. It may call us to take a stand that is unpopular. It may draw us down a path that our family and friends do not understand. A choice made on principle, can even drive people away. Standing with the children of Israel on the brink of crossing into the Promised Land, Moses tells the people that there will be moments before them that they will be called to choose between good and evil, truth, falsehood, life, and death, and he commands them to always choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days. Moses, in today's Old Testament lesson, and Jesus, in the Gospel, are both speaking to large crowds. Both men are speaking about the importance of choice. Moses is standing before a multitude that is at the completion of a long 40-year journey. And Jesus is talking to a crowd that is trying to decide whether or not to journey with Jesus. Both are talking about choice. The tough choices of faithfulness, devotion to God above everything else. They're talking about the choices that you and I have to make every day. Whether to follow God or to go back to following our own desires and wander then forever in the wilderness. Both sermons are not quite what the crowd wants to hear. Most people want sermons to be pep talks. Rah, rah, you can do it if only you try hard enough stem winders. 
neither Moses nor Jesus offers the people that kind of problem. They tell the truth. To follow God in a world that doesn't is going to be hard. Moses' speech may have been designed to lead people into the promised land, but Jesus' little homily was better designed to lead people to the exits. The scholars have tried to explain what Jesus said away by saying that he was just using a technique that was popular among rabbis of his day, extreme hyperbole, a kind of dramatic exaggeration that makes a sharp point even sharper. Still, he does it five times in his message, and each time, if you use your imagination and watch carefully, you can see more and more of the crowd melting away. The thesis point of Jesus' speech is the same as that of Moses. If you want to be a follower, God must be more important in your life than even your family. It's important to note that the word Jesus uses and we translate as hate really means to become detached from. But even that in our westernized, civilized culture is hard for us to understand. We are not hated for being a Christian. Well, as I said a couple of weeks ago, it was once expected that you would be one and that you would go to church. Even if you were like the ushers at Nebo, my home parish, who came during the summer months, passed out bulletins, and then went outside to smoke, still you were counted as being there. How much they heard through the windows and the open doors and their self-created haze, I do not know, but they were there. They were in the crowds. Now, even the crowds are gone. Because being a Christian is no longer seen to be the thing to do in our society. It's treated not with contempt, but with benign neglect.